Hello students, welcome to The Analyst, dated 31st of August 2023. Today we'll look at 5 important articles from the Indian Express and the Hindu. The first article will be regarding the Aadhaar Act and the Judgment. Then we'll look at Drots. Then we'll look at the PLI scheme. And finally we'll look at two prelim related articles. One is PM Ojwala Yojana. Then we'll compare and contrast Gruha Lakshmi scheme with PM Kisan Samman Nidhi. Now the first article pertains to your Aadhaar and this is your GS2. This also becomes important part of your governance. Now let's understand the genesis of Aadhaar. So there was multiplicity of IDs. Secondly, if I want to go for state to state so i am finding different regulations so we needed a pan india id card to say so so the genesis was back in 2009 in the erstwhile planning commission now gradually Aadhaar took its shape with the statutory backing of the Aadhaar Act of 2016. Now, what is Aadhaar? So, it is a 12-digit unique identification number. This number has to be arbitrary. That means, let's say there is number 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? This number should not be linked somehow to my identity that means this number should not reveal my identity even though it is a number but it cannot tell the details let's say uh, 1 2 a l s q r let's say a stands for a name l stands for a location so such alphanumerical interpretation of id was not used instead it was only a 12 digit unique number then it is about an individual resident that means what it is not about household household that means let's say father mother and two children so aadhar is not about a household it is about a resident individual resident then it is a proof of identity and not of citizenship. So no one can claim their right to citizenship because they have a Aadhaar. So it is totally based on being a resident, ordinary resident for 182 days. Now, how do I get this 12 digit unique ID is by submitting two information. One is biometric, the other is demographic. So in biometric, let's say I am giving my fingerprints as well as my iris scan. Then in demography, let's say I am giving them my date of birth, place of birth, etc. So using these two information, a 12 digit number will be mapped to my identity. And this is not to be revealed in public. It is my unique ID. That means naturally, Privacy is built in and we'll understand why we are talking about privacy. Then the UIDAI will handle all this data. So it will be the authority or you can say regulator. Who will regulate Aadhaar? So it is the UIDAI. And UIDAI also got its statutory backing with the Aadhaar Act of 2016. So before this, it was an executive body. And with the statutory backing, it became a statutory body. Now, almost 99% of adults are enrolled. More than 135 crore Aadhaar. And it has also now directly being used in digital rollout of goods, services, transfer of subsidies and most importantly the direct benefit transfers to citizens which will the same infrastructure was also used 
during covid so the idea of jam trinity mooted back in 2015-16 so jandhan aadhar mobile and now the aadhar stacks is being used for multiple services that is provided by the government not only the central government but also the state governments now <clears throat> what does the aadhar act do so basically it authorizes uidai and it reposes faith that uidai shall safeguard the information in its possession it will control the information then any information stored in central identities data repository so all the data whether it is demographic data biometric data or any authorization data that aadhar uh, that is linked to aadhar and comes to uidai will be the sole responsible authority then to prove one's identity we may willingly use that means it is not compulsory what is not compulsory so to enroll in aadhar then in physical or in electronic format so this is also the time where we were going from physical governance to e governance so rapid development in governance also so now acceptance of physical as well as electronic form of aadhar then it is protected against unauthorized access use disclosure etc finally there also be penalties imposed if there is any data breach or if anyone misuses the aadhar data now let's look at some riders so no core biometric data gathered or developed under this act shall be shared with any individual for any reason whatsoever secondly utilized for any other intent what is the intent the intent has to be in the aadhar act so any other use any extension of use of the same data is not allowed now what happened is that the aadhar was being rapidly rolled out so all the government departments they started asking for aadhar numbers right then the goi had multiple data multiple data sets so those data sets were now being linked with aadhar so a you are asking for aadhar number for multiple services that the government provides b you are linking the data with aadhar for example banking details for example pan card details your visa etc so all those things if are linked with aadhar so it creates a a kind of data set of an individual so multiple data sets of an individual now over the period of time what happened with the aadhar rollout that it became very easy to do ki e kycs so what happened multiple apps banks and many startups also they started asking for aadhar and then they would again authenticate that data with let's say uidai so let's say i am buying something from an app and let's say i have to disclose my aadhar number so what would happen this data that i have bought something would also naturally go because i am going for authentication so concerns were raised on the use potential misuse of the aadhar data and therefore this was challenged before the supreme court so the supreme court was primarily required to assess if the provisions of the aadhar act were contrary to the right of privacy why right of privacy because this was also the time of privacy judgment under j puttu swami judgment basically so here what happened your right to privacy became what a fundamental right under article 21 now what does article 13 say so article 13 say that any law which abridges
abridges a fundamental right can be questioned and to say so it will be again nullified so any law which violates your fundamental right and let's appreciate that any law passed from the legislature from the from the parliament is below the fundamental rights so fundamental rights are naturally above any statutes so what would happen so such acts can be questioned they can be challenged on the grounds that they are violating the fundamental right and given that in 2017 only the privacy judgment was there that means right to privacy became a fundamental right so if aadhar act or aadhar violated privacy so what would happen it can be nullified so that is why it was challenged now the question was not so much whether this was an infringement infringement of what infringement of article 21 on the right of privacy but whether it was a reasonable exception that simply means whenever i say there is a right whenever there is a right and we mean to say a fundamental right so a fundamental right coupled up with reasonable restriction now the idea was ki whether or not aadhar is a reasonable restriction how come because it is serving some state purpose and what is the purpose of the state is to benefit people so let's see what the court has said now firstly the court upheld the aadhar act so act was done okay with it is okay right it is not uh, it was not declared unconstitutional it, it was upheld its constitutionally was upheld then it allowed for aadhar based authentication for what so aadhar is allowed for what to establish identity for what for benefit some benefit some service some direct benefit transfer which is accruing any benefit which is coming from let's say gui state government the consolidated fund of india so any government scheme which is trying to transfer some money etc so basically transfer of subsidies payments etc so that simply means that i will use the aadhar to identify you and only identify you so that i can targetedly deliver you services subsidies etc that means apart from these areas the aadhar act will not be used that means even though it did not nullify the act but it limited the act and we'll see how then it disallowed the use of individual aadhar numbers by any private entities for any purpose pursuant to a contract to a legal contract so what was happening that <coughs> what i cannot do directly i cannot do also indirectly so let's say the private sector is allowed to use aadhar for let's say identity but in the name of use of aadhar i cannot indirectly make it mandatory right so that means it should be an option that whether or not i want to furnish the aadhar details or i want to produce my driving license so any form of id has to be acceptable right now <clears throat> let's appreciate the right to privacy under article 21 so the court held that the right to privacy cannot be impinged without a just fair and reasonable law so what we needed just fair and reasonable law so if we have a just fair and reasonable law we can somehow we can somehow take parts away of privacy so it will be turned as a reasonable restriction now so what do i need i need a law first 
a proper law coming from the parliament, right? From the legislature. Then I need to have a state aim. What the state wants to achieve? Let's say I want to transfer 10,000 rupees to farmers. So is it a legitimate state aim? Absolutely, yes. But let's say I want to identify an individual. I want to take police action against this individual because that person is a political opponent or something else. Mm -hmm. I want to go for any targeted action on an individual. So is it a legitimate state aim? Absolutely not. It can only be done if it is an internal security issue and that too with higher authorization. Next, it should be proportionate. So, let's say I want to send 10,000 rupees. So, I can only bring a law which enables me to transfer that money. Not in the garb of transferring 10,000 rupees, I cannot bring a law which gives me extraordinary power. Right? Why? Because we are dealing with the right to privacy which is now a fundamental right. Then, we must appreciate that the third point of privacy was proportionality. So this becomes very pertinent that what is proportionality and how proportionality can be judged. Let's say what is a proportional act and what is a wrongful act. So the Supreme Court in J. Swami gave this. The proportionality test. So A, there must be a legitimate goal that is a state goal or state aim. Then there must be a rational connection, a nexus between the two. Let's say I want to do this and I am doing this. So they do not have a nexus. But if I intend to do this and I am doing this, then it is reasonable because there is more nexus. So similarity between the means and the ends. So both must be linked. They should not be unnecessarily linked. Then there should be a necessity. Now, is there a necessity to abridge someone's right to privacy? There must be very good cause. So necessity is also important. And are there any other alternatives? So rather than rolling out the Aadhaar, can, can we uh, transfer the subsidies through another way? And the last is the balance. Balance between what? between the work that I tend to achieve and the rights that I am infringing. So they must be in balance. Let's say I want to give this much benefit and I am taking away this much right. Then it becomes imbalanced. So this is the proportionality test and proportionality test comes. Why? Because we have to determine whether it is a just and reasonable law which violates our right to privacy. Now, two sections were the most debated sections and you can use these this content whenever there are discussions on privacy, wherever there are discussions on Article 21, whenever there are discussions on Article 14, 19. So, because Aadhaar was challenged on the grounds of 14, 19 and 21. Article 14, 19 and 21. So we can bring these discussions, the Aadhaar judgment, the J. Putu Swami judgment, the doctrine, uh, the test of proportionality, then what is a fair and reasonable law, what are the basic tenets. So all those things we can bring in the discussion of Article 21, 14, 19. Right? Now, two important sections of Aadhaar was section 7. And section 57. Section 57 was read down. It was read down. Why? Because we will today understand how arbitrary powers can be granted through a single section. So let's read 57 first. So this provision allowed government entities, body corporates and individual to use the Aadhaar number for establishing the identity of an individual for any purpose. So this any purpose became the bone of contention because if you are not defining the four boundaries of your authority then your authority today can be this tomorrow it can be this and the day after it can be this and what what have we learned 
that we always follow checks and balances, right? Then section 7 was debated why? Because it makes Aadhaar number mandatory for receiving subsidies, benefits and services from the government. So this was hotly debated but this was upheld and it was seen as a legitimate state concern. Why? Because there was a lot of misappropriation of subsidies. And our uh, famous jargon of uh, giving 1 rupee and not receiving even 10 paise at the grassroots level. So whenever we are going for direct benefit transfers, what happens? This illegitimate method, these embezzlements, the bribery, the corruption and the entire nexus that is very hardly hit. Why? Because now the government can directly communicate to its people. And there is no need of middlemen. And let's say this middlemen were in layers. Then what would happen? In each layer, there will be a filtration process of the government budgetary allocation. And therefore, this breeds corruption, greed and a lot of bribery. And it also breeds political corruption. Now, one more issue was that Aadhaar was passed as a money bill. But this also Supreme Court upheld. Why? Because it has to do with targeted benefit transfer, tra targeted transfer of subsidies. So it deals with money only. Use of public money and transfer from Consolidated Fund of India, also from the states. Now let's look at the second issue. This is regarding that Maharashtra is facing or it is staring at drought and agri-crisis and this pertains to your GS1 it also can pertain to your GS3 disaster management now let's appreciate the geography of Maharashtra a little and let's look at the regions that Maharashtra has so the coastal region is Konkan and the interiors is Vidarbha and Marathwada now, over the period of time, what we have seen in news is that the Vidarbha region and the Maratwada region, they suffer from recurrent farm distress and some form of water scarcity and at times agri droughts, agricultural droughts. Now, why these two regions face such problems lies the answer lies in the geography. Why? Because we have the western ghat in this orientation. And if I go, if I look from let's say the Kerala coast, then it looks like this. And this is your eastern ghats. So what happens is that the southwest monsoon they will hit the western guards the western flank of the western guards which are lying here so southwest monsoon coming all the way from mascarene it will hit the coast and what happens it rises as it rises it cools down and so what will happen the moment there is cooling down there will be condensation and so torrential amount of rainfall on the western flank of western guards then through these passes, multiple passes are there, Palgaard, Borgaard. So through these passes, these winds will go inside and it will lead to more rainfall. But till it reaches the interiors, what happens? This wind, the southwest monsoon winds, they dry. So they dry up. Therefore, creating divide of rain. So, while the coastal regions of Maharashtra will receive torrential amount of rainfall, the western guards will receive torrential amount of rainfall, but the interiors, because it is in the rain shadow region, it will get less rainfall. And therefore, these regions are 
drought prone regions and the vegetation is also towards the side of semi arid grasslands and parched drylands now let's look at what is a drought so it is nothing but a long period of dry weather and insufficient precipitation which causes acute dry condition but more so drought is most visible in agriculture so let's say there is paucity of rain right there is also paucity of water i mean surface water let's say the lakes the ponds they have less water this season because the rain was low but it becomes a bigger issue when all of these factors the availability of moisture the availability of water in our reservoirs the rain all of that becomes an issue only when it affects agriculture why because 42.5% of india is directly and 60% of india indirectly they are dependent on the agri economy we also know that around 70% of india lives in the villages and these villages they are mostly rural plus agrarian so combination of rural and agrarian simultaneously we also see high incidence of poverty also so when multiple socio economic issues they combine along with the vagaries of nature what happens it affects the agriculture now simultaneously we must appreciate that 89% of total indian water whatever water we use is going towards agriculture and if this quantum of water is decreased then what happens then it affects our crops and later our produce later inflation so a lot of issues are directly linked to how our crops are performing and in turn these the crop performance will depend upon what kind of moisture we have in a area we also must know that approximately 50% of india is rain fed and if we are rain fed that means we are at the mercy of southwest monsoon now let's look at what are the reasons behind these droughts so whenever we are talking about natural factors the first is southwest monsoon and in the southwest monsoon we can see that a there is 3 to 4 month concentration which we can depict like this right because rest of the times there is almost no rain so 3 to 4 months there is 70 to 80% concentration of rain secondly there are these disparities good example is coastal maharashtra versus vidarbha so what happens one region is wet and one region is dry in the same state and this disparity has been created by because the monsoon is not fair to both these regions it is not equal because of different reasons rainfall is not equal then what happens then you have some external factors let's say in the enso cycle what did we learn that whenever there is el nino it amounts to less rainfall in india and whenever there is la nina so there is too much rain so what are we getting we are getting that 3 to 4 month concentration then disparities and these disparities can also be in form of monsoon breaks 
सर्डन ब्रेक्स इन मॉनसून एंड ऑल्सो सर्डन बर्स्ट इन मॉनसून साइमल्टेनियसली वॉट आर वी सींग वी आर ऑल्सो लुकिंग एट इन सेसेंट ट्रेन वेर इन द हिमालयास so incessant rains in the himalayas and drought like situations in the interiors of maharashtra what does this tell us it tells us that the patterns of monsoon are also changing and what can we say about these patterns so a the rain is either to rapid or it is too slow that means if it is dry condition then the intensity is very high if it is rain condition then again it is extreme second regions where we were expecting let's say 100 cm of rain they are getting 170 cm of rain right so the overall patterns are also changing the regions where it used to rain heavily they are receiving less rainfall and why these patterns are changing because of global warming climate change what else the depletion of water resources so we have seen that 89% of water india's total water use is going towards agriculture and over the period of time since 1950s what we have seen is that there is a continuous decline in the per capita usage of water let's say from 1950 to 2023 continuous decline in per capita availability of drinking water and water simultaneously what we have seen we have also seen that there is a saturation whether we talk about crops let's say we tries there is a saturation in the amount of money that i can earn and that is why there are talks of doubling farmer income so traditional crops are not giving that much money so what are we doing we are switching towards different crops so new type of crops let's say we are growing sugarcane in marathwada alternatively what i am doing is i am pumping more water in the same crops so more ground water depletion and ms swaminathan he said that the ground water should be used as the last resort but what are we doing we are even using ground water for construction for construction of high rises so what is happening that multiple factors whether it is natural whether it is human they are contributing to more dryness let's look at the anthropogenic factors so inappropriate agriculture activities and the best example is growing of water guzzling crops then going for flood irrigation also going for water exports let's say there is very high demand for some fruit or some veggies globally so 80% of a veggie is water so what i am doing i am growing it in marathwada or vidarb and then i am exporting it so what will happen i am essentially exporting water from a region which suffers from dryness and it's a drought prone region what else <clears throat> we have already gone for deforestation so we have depleted our old growth forest and so the areas which are deforested what will happen its carrying capacity has already decreased and its moisture holding capacity has also decreased furthermore these regions are more prone to erosion so the surface will be very prone to erosion right 
what else we have encroached into our wetlands so whether we are talking about ponds lakes etc good examples are tamil nadu uttar pradesh uttar pradesh is the highest has has encroached into the highest number of wetlands in india and the second rank lies with tamil nadu according to the recent census of water bodies conducted by the ministry of jal shakti so the ministry says that uttar pradesh and tamil nadu they have gone for massive encroachment of wetlands and such classic examples are also seen nearby chennai and also in karnataka in bengaluru right in delhi we can take up the example of the yamuna flood plains that are being continuously encroached through residential encroachment right now how to mitigate these droughts so we used to go for relief centric approach that means to give money or to provide immediate help but now we have to go towards holistic and integrated management that means what we are looking at the preemptory level we have to prevent we have to go at the precursory level that means let's say this is the drought so i have to look before the drought happens that simply means i will work on prevention i'll work on mitigation and i'll work on preparedness now what can we do about droughts how can we solve these droughts so first we have to look at our agriculture activities so we need to take up crops which are agro climatically suited and agro ecologically suited we cannot take water guzzling crops in dry regions right then agri has to move towards more environmental friendly models so let's take some examples we have to look at the issue of water through precision farming or precision agriculture where we are using the idea is water use efficiency which is also encapsulated in pradhan mantri krishi sanchai yojana is per drop more crop so water use efficiency precision farming precision agriculture precision irrigation is the need of the hour what are the best examples your drip irrigation your sprinklers and who is the leader it is israel so we learning from israel two things about water management a you store a lot of water b whenever you use that water go for efficiency efficiency of water use and broadly we can also say resource use efficiency so <clears throat> a we have to take up good crops crops which are suited to the local ecology the local climate and we have to also move towards precision agriculture water use efficiency simultaneously we have to store more water so how do i store more from the 4000 billion cubic meter that india receives yearly how do i save more rain water so i go for more sponge areas i have to create the public utilities uh, the public authorities they have to create more ponds 
मोर वेल्स सेकेंडली आई हैव टू टेक अप रेन वॉटर हार्वेस्टिंग एंड दिस रेन वॉटर हार्वेस्टिंग कैन बी इधर ट्रेडिशनल लेट्स से जाबो कोंड सुरंगम्स और दे कैन ऑल्सो बी मॉडर्न एज इन सी एज सीन इन अर्बन डिजाइन्स देन दीज रीजन्स मस्ट ऑल्सो अप्रिशिएट द विजडम ऑफ वॉटर शेड डेवलपमेंट सो वॉटर शेड द इंटायर रीजन हैज टू बी प्लैंड and it includes managing the southwest monsoon managing the grasslands managing the trees the animals fodder everything so entire ecosystem approach has to be adopted in such dry regions because if i am asking my farmers to move away from water guzzling cash crops then i need to provide them with alternative alternative in the form of let's say quail farming let's say in the form of goat farming right simultaneously we also have to look at models like pani sansad models where the entire community their capacity building training is taking place and they are working together to create these water structures where the rain is stored and these structures are to be built pre monsoon right what else then any kind of data that we can have whether it is about climate whether it is about southwest monsoon etc so all the data they have to be integrated and direct forecasting of the same data the result of such data to mobiles so an early warning system to the farmers so that they can prepare well in advance let's look at the pli scheme this pertains to your gs3 so what do i mean by the pli scheme so a there has to be a production production manufacturing of what of goods and it is directly linked to incentive so if i produce more i'll get more incentives who gives this incentives it is gui government of india and these pli schemes are launched for multiple sectors so approximately 14 sectors they have been launched now what is the idea behind pli so the idea is to go for more make in india whether it is for india or for the world make in india or manufacture in india this does what this reduces our import dependency then it also boosts our export potential so simultaneously what do what are we seeing that i want more manufacturing i want more exports i want to cut down on imports and i do not want to import let's say non essential items why to become let's say atmanirbhar so self reliance is the moot issue then it doesn't mean that we are cutting off ourselves from the world but we are now wanting to be part of the global supply chain why should we import let's say a hanger or a basket from china where these hangers and baskets have created jobs so why can't we manufacture the hanger and basket in india and create these jobs at home right then simultaneously 
why should i trade with trade distortions so if i am seeing that let's say the chinese hanger even if i am imposing some duties the chinese hanger finds its way to let's say delhi through singapore through malaysia through any asean countries because we have a free trade agreement even though we are not part of the rcep so what do we want to do we want to manufacture the same quality that means quality is also essential and when we are talking about quality we also require the technology so who do i ask to bring all of this so it is the private sector and this private sector will bring in what fund they will invest they will bring tech they will bring human resource also skills capability building human resource capital so this private sector will also be aided and abated by the government of india why because they are taking a risk but this risk is not blind these risk are taken in some strategic areas where india thinks that it can outshine and it can achieve all the objectives now simultaneously what have we seen from china that the chinese economy is a manufacturing led economy and it migrated from agri to manufacturing and to services what happened with india india went directly from agri to services so somewhere down the line the contribution towards manufacturing is low and that is why the more focus right from 2014 in make in india then atmanirbhar bharat during covid times and then the pli scheme the idea is to invite india indian companies as well as global companies as well as startups to come and make in india to build manufacturing capacity in back in india and eventually what happens is that with involvement of global players india will also learn the trade secrets of let's say exports the technologies will also permeate let's say in japan there is a technology which is being used in a train now using our own methods and our looking at our own market the same tech can be applied to let's say the domestic metro or it can be used in buses so whenever we bring any technology whenever we ask foreign players domestic players or both of them to create a joint venture or ask startups to come invest in india and the government is supporting the idea is that along with the manufacturing a lot of dividends in form of technology also permeate into the larger economy which can create ripple effects and butterfly effects now incentives will be in form of so let's say i am producing 1000 articles and next year i am producing 2000 articles and next year i am producing 2500 articles so this year i will get incentive on 1000 articles why because it is based upon incremental sales so what is the addition then here the incentive will be based on the 500 extra sales that i did but these incentives can be as low as 1% and they can be as high as 20% and what is the total outlay approximately 2 to 3 lakh crores and these individual schemes are evolving as of now the issue that we see today in the pli scheme is that government has only spent 1.5% of let's say out of the 100% that it has promised till this date now 
some sectors the incentive is based on performance and local value addition rather than on the basis of incremental sales so let's say incremental sales will be applicable on let's say mobile electronics right and this 1 to 20 percent of incentive is it also varies from sector to sector now what are the challenges the biggest challenge is let's say the chinese manufacturing so even if we are not directly trading with china directly importing with china the chinese material is indirectly coming to india through multiple routes right so the global competition what are the new areas of competition let's say countries like vietnam bangladesh so whenever an investor is looking for low cost manufacturing they are going to regions where labor laws are not adhered to so laos cambodia vietnam bangladesh they are picking up a lot of investments so after covid majority of the companies adopted the china plus one strategy so companies would diversify from china out of china towards one more country right then the issue of technology and innovation so if i have got a tech and i have protected it through a patent i would not give away the technology without let's say a government to government agreement or let's say a huge royalty if it is a successful technology or i may take up part of the revenues so it becomes extremely difficult to go for high end manufacturing when the technology is sophisticated and the royalty charges are very high then naturally we suffer from infrastructure bottlenecks and supply chain issue whenever we are talking about infrastructure we always should look at the logistics cost and the delays thereof and when we are looking at supply chain we want to become part of the supply chains we want to become part of the global value chains but it is very difficult to start to become a part of a supply chain and what do i mean by supply chain let's say there is manufacturing here there are some distributors here and let's say we are manufacturing mobile and people are trading with each other now if i do not if i am not part of these chains then it is very difficult to get in why because countries who are part of these supply chains they tend to give more incentives so that they do not face competition so state sponsored trade distortions are seen in supply chains second issue is supply chain disruption because of global events because of oil prices right then the issue of delayed disbursements that we are talking about 1.5% only that was used then insufficient investment so with 2 lakh crores it was mooted that the private companies will invest 520 billion dollars now according to some commentators the two do not make sense and the government will naturally will have to support more why because this support from government is competitive so let's say there is more governmental support in vietnam then the company would choose if if both of us are equally positioned and there is more governmental support uh, the land is cheaper then naturally the company would try to go to the cheaper places right then sectoral disparities let's say one sector is getting 90000 crores let's say the semiconductor sector and the other sector sector 2 is only getting 200 crores so there are sectoral disparities also and naturally the issues that plague india is the red tapeism the administrative bureaucracy the bottlenecks that we see then the economic cycles bust and boom bust and boom 
So what happens is that while I am expecting that there is a boom, I am building manufacturing capacity, I am building manufacturing capacity, and then suddenly there is a bust. So what happens? What happened after 2008? What happened after COVID? So oversupply. And this is also part of the economic cycle. Now let's look at the LPG cylinder price cut. So the Prime Minister has announced that there will be a 200 rupee cut in cylinder prices. What are the reasons? Retail inflation, fuel prices directly affecting the household and who will suffer the most? The poor, the below poverty line households, then the middle class. So a breather. Why? Because there is inflation which is created due to high prices of gas. And why do we see that the issue of gas pricing, oil pricing is changing time and again? Because there are geopolitical disruptions in form of Russia-Ukraine war. Let's look at Ujwala. So PM Ujwala Yojana was launched in 2016. The idea was to give cylinders to BPL households. Now here we are using households. In Aadhaar we were looking at individuals. Household means a family. Family of let's say mother, mother father and three children or two children, right? Then these are free LPG connection and along with this 1600 rupees of financial assistance. Now Ujwala 1 was a success and the target was first 8 crore cylinders which was later revised to 8 crore and which has already been completed in 2019 and right now we have 9.3 crore beneficiary of the Ujwala Yojana. Now this Yojana has been discontinued since then but we also saw that a part 2 of the Ujwala Yojana came but after 2019 it has been discontinued. Now why Ujwala becomes a very good case study is because it has done some remarkable feats. It has achieved some remarkable feats. A. It has made smoke free kitchens. So it can be a very good case study for women empowerment. Simultaneously, parallelly, it has also looked at forest conservation. Why? Because our energy needs were being fulfilled by plucking on these bark, these trees, these branches. So, some form of conservation also. Simultaneously, the growth of our gas infrastructure. The pipeline network, the distributor network, right? Then we are also looking at moving away from the traditional chulhas, which were more dangerous than the usual industrial smoke or cigarette smoke. So it was 10 times dangerous, right? So respiratory illness, etc. Now, in the part two of Ujwala, focus was given towards migrant workers. Why? Because migrant workers usually do not have a local ID. So what was happened? What was happening is that they can give a self declaration to avail the benefit. Now let's look at some data. So 58% growth in domestic LPG sales. Then we also look at an augmented distributor network. Then we also look at consumer base widening from 0 crore under Ujwala Yojana to 9.59 CR. And if we look at the total consumers, so 31 crore consumers. Now, this is apart from the gas pipelines that we are creating, that is the city gas networks. 
So, because of Ujwala, the illegal trade of gas cylinders that has also gone down. Because the moment one is empowered with a gas cylinder, they can go for refill. But what was happening that people used to buy at higher prices and the poor people used to buy, let's say the market prices at 1000 rupees. So you would go give 5500 rupees, right, as security amount to take the first cylinder and 1500 rupees per cylinder to illegally buy gas. Now, the idea of going kerosene free has also worked in states like Punjab, Haryana and Andhra Pradesh. And gradually this will also permeate to the other states. Now let's look at the Gruha Lakshmi scheme. And here we must appreciate that what is a universal basic income because this scheme has been launched by the Karnataka government. And we'll look at Gruha Lakshmi and PM Kisan and try to compare and contrast. Now what is a universal basic income? That means it is open to all, so universal. Basic income means to sustain life. Income, let's say in form of monthly payment or yearly payment or even daily payments based upon, you know, daily requirements. So a universal basic income is to empower and to include all. But should we include the rich, the wealthy, the 1% or the 1% of the 1%? So the answer is no. It doesn't make any sense. So we are experimenting with these pseudo UBIs or we can say partial UBIs or we can directly say these direct benefit transfers to a particular target group. So let's look at the two schemes because such schemes are becoming more vogue, more particularly at the state level. So in the Gruha Lakshmi, 2000 rupees will be given per month to women. So per month that means accounts for 12 into 2000 that is 24,000 going towards each household and the household, the woman head of the household. So approximately 1.1 crore women have registered and 17,500 crores. That means essentially if I am giving this money to a household, that means uh, I am giving 2,000 uh, 2, per family only, per month, right? Then there are some natural exclusions and inclusions. Exclusions like if you are a government employee or you are a pensioners, so natural exclusion, automatic exclusion. Then the second scheme is, this is a central sector scheme, 100% funding coming from government of India. Here, we are going for 6,000 for year. And this is only for farmers. That means we are essentially giving 2,000 rupees three times. Why are we giving this amount three times? Because on an average, India grows two to three crops, right? So this is as the input cost. Some help in the input cost, let's say to buy seeds, etc. Because any which way, the urea, uh, the uh, fertilizer subsidy is being given, right? Simultaneously, if we give this amount of money in three equal installments for let's say buying seeds, etc. For the inputs of agriculture, what happens is the agenda or the goal of doubling farmer income. It becomes easy. Why? Because it empowers farmers to buy quality seeds, etc. Now, who will transfer the money? The money will be directly transferred in both the cases from the government only. So direct benefit transfers to the bank. Here, the state government will identify. Here, the state government will give the list of beneficiaries to the central government and central government will only look at the payments. That means here, if the state government is not providing the list, then the payments are naturally delayed. 
So these two schemes we can take up and any other scheme, let's say in MP, the Lardley scheme is being run. So multiple schemes are being run where direct benefit transfers are being tried out or partial benefit transfers are being tried out. Thank you so much. I hope it helped.